God, what a blessed and holy time it is. God, we rejoice once again that we're able to be uh, gathered in this time for the place and the time of worship. God, we want to honor you today. God, you deserve it all. And uh, God, today as we, uh, God, as we baptize Amelia, me, me, God, we know her. Uh, God, just a, God, just a precious young lady, God. You got so much in store for her. God, it took her, took her a while to take that step. She gave her life to you some time ago, but today, uh, God, she follows through in obedience and baptism, God. God, we glorify you in the freedom that we gain from that. And for Devin, Lord, and the journey that you have him on, and God, the same thing, gave his life to you. Kind of took off on some tangents, Lord, and, and God, as all of us have done, and God, full circle, to come back and say, you know, Lord Jesus, you saved me. I need to follow through with baptism. God, a young man before us. God, he's, he's headed to the military. God, I just, as I prayed with him earlier, God, I just lift him to you. God, this church body, family, friends, guests, God, what a great, great day. Lord, just to worship. Father, we want to honor you. We want to give you this time. In Christ's name. Maybe see you.
not been easy for them. It's never easy. But God, I pray for him. I pray you to adorn him with your presence. I talked to him a little bit ago, God, the anxiety of uh, going in the military. God, I pray for an undergirding. I pray, God, you put some people around him that can cause him and help him on his journey with Christ. That's what I pray for. I pray for the protection of God and the hand of God. Thank you so much for death and the young man, God, for which he's recovered. God, we just ask you blessing on him today in the name of Jesus. Devin, today, Jesus commands our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Upon your public profession of faith in him, I'm able to baptize you today as my brother. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in sin, arise to walk.
Messiah. The one Jesus, the one called to save, the one who saves. Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. So the Jesus Christ is the anointed one, the one that was called to save us. That, that's what Jesus Christ, Christ is not just his last name, it's Jesus Christ. The called out one, the anointed one, specifically set out to save us. Not just eternally, but how about right here and now? He can save us out of our trouble. Just so many advantages to Jesus Christ versus everything else.
couldn't do anything else in our life, there's been plenty that you've done to get our praise from here going forward. There's some people that God's done a whole lot for. And we don't even, some of us don't even give them praise. How can we be in the presence of God and not be moved? Just like the song says. How can I stand here today and not be moved by even the thought of who God is and what God has done? This is amazing grace. What David showed to Philip is amazing grace. What David showed to Saul is amazing grace. What Jesus showed to us all, this is amazing grace. God, how can we escape? How can we deny such a great salvation? Jesus Christ, the one called out to sin. God, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name. And then we can be seen. Wow. Pulled up this morning just to find with God in the presence of God. I don't want to disappoint our little ones this morning, but I just went and asked Abby for permission. Uh, parents, I, I want to keep the little ones in. You'll see why I'm very basic message. And at the end, the Lord's Supper. And I want you to bring your kids, if they've been saved, and profess Christ. I want you to come together, and I'll give you some specific instructions at the end. I had to plan on doing it that way. I want you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Titus chapter 3. For our folks, uh, we're going to be on a journey. Father's Day is next week. We've been on this journey talking about the voice of God. Just the, the touch of God, the very presence of God. Uh, last week we talked about authority, submission, doing some good works, um, just really being uh, what God wants us to be. But I'm telling you, I want you to see something this morning. I want to ask you a sobering question. Kids, I want you to listen. Our smallest kids, kindergartners and up, that would normally be out, I want you to listen. What's the difference? What's really the difference? And you're going to be able to develop that question. I'm convinced that we look into a world that sees the church as no different. I want you to think about that. I want it to soak in. You might want to regurgitate it a little bit. Is your life different because of Christ? When you go home today, when you get out of this building, is your life different? Is there something different about your home and your life at home because of Jesus? Is there a place that you can go in your life Maybe not a definite time, maybe not a definite place, but there's a place there to where you know that Jesus and you came together on a crash course and he changed your life. You see, that's exactly what happened in Calvary. Sin and God came together and they crashed at Calvary. And who won? God. God won. So I, wanted, I want you to see that today. You see, we have it so easy. We all got in our fine automobiles and put on our clothes today. And we drove up here and we were expecting air condition. And probably if we came in and the air wasn't on, we left. But we were expecting the sound and the, the screams and all that kind of stuff. But what if? If all that hadn't happened, if we didn't sing a song you didn't like, didn't say a word you didn't care about, can you still worship? Can you get beyond that kind of stuff to say, I had a good time with God today? I want to ask you, what's the difference? Because I want to put you on the spot this morning. We talked about baptism and what we went through with those two candidates. What kind of a difference is there? What's the difference? We got a little girl. 
What does May mean? Third or fourth grade, fifth grade? What is it? Third grade? Fourth. 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 What's the difference in that little fourth grade and that little innocence? And you. And me. And Devin, who's graduated from high school. What's the difference? You know, the fact is that we ought to be living for Jesus. And what we are in here, we ought to be out there if we're born again. So I want you to see it this morning. And I, I want our eyes to be open. And at the end, I'm going to give you something. I gave it to our church on Wednesday night, and I said, Doug, I'm not going to give it until Sunday. And somebody said, well, I think I'll reconsider. And I did. And I am. And uh, whether you're a guest or not, doesn't matter. Because it pertains to you and your walk with Christ. And uh, I'm going to give it to you at the end. Look at verse, uh, chapter 3, and we're going to look at all verse 11 verses. First two verses of last Sunday, but I want you to see the picture. It'll be on the screen if you want to follow along. I'm using Holman Christian this morning for simplicity and wording. Paul's talking to Titus, very difficult position in Crete. Things are going on. People who are against the gospel are moving, much like we see today. People are looking and staring with their arms crossed and they're mad about whatever's going on in life. And God wants to do something. And here's what it said. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. To slander no one. To avoid fighting. To be at peace, if you will. And to be at kind. To be always showing gentleness. Humility to all people. For we too were once foolish. I want you to listen to this. For we too were once foolish. Put yourself there. You know what we're talking about. We too were once foolish disobedient, deceived, and, and, and Holman Christian uses the word captive there. But another word that fits is enslaved to various passions. Don't ask me, what's your passion this morning? What are you passionate about? And your pleasures. We were captives of these pleasures. Do we live in a pleasurable society? Think about it. Living in malice. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. We don't use that word anymore, but almost every translation puts it there for a reason. And envy. Hateful. Look what it says. Detesting. We were once those that were hateful. You know any hateful people? You know any hateful people that come in church or a building one every day? Detesting. We were once those that detested one another. Look at verse 4. But when it's goodness. Now listen, that word but... You ought to highlight that thing, put errors, asterisks, whatever. But when the goodness and the love for man, imagine that, God loves us. Dirty, filthy, rotten, me. But when the goodness and love for man appeared from God our Savior, He saved us. Not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy. Through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit then poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by His grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. This is a saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist to declare these things. So that those who have believed God might be careful to devote. That's serious there. So that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. And that's probably as far as we're going to get today. But I want you to listen to the rest of it. There are good and profitable. These are good and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish debates, arguing, genealogies, fights, quarrels, disputes about the law. For they're unprofitable and worthless. Reject was well, hard. Reject a divisive person after the first or second morning, knowing that such a person is perverted and sins being self-defeated. That's some major words. 
Let's go to the Lord. God, I pray that you'd open our eyes. I pray, God, that we see your word. I pray, God, that we delve into it. I pray, God, that, Lord, you would speak like you've never spoken before. I pray that you would encompass us like you never have before. It's my prayer, God, this morning that we become less, you become more, that God, hearts and lives are literally open to you right now. People walk off the street. They don't want to be here, but they're here. God, I'm asking you, Lord, that they would open their doors so that you could come and minister to them in their point of greatest need. God, I'm asking you on this platform this morning to minister to my greatest need. God, I pray that there wouldn't be a, a word, God, that's said out of my mouth as your messenger this morning that would be not a part of you, Lord, this morning. God, hold us accountable, but help us, God, to literally be a different difference and make a difference, God, in the world to which we live. God, I want you to get the glory. Every man, every woman, every little boy, little girl that's in this place this morning, I pray, God, that we would relinquish control and allow you to have the control of our life and we would be confident in that leadership. God, get the glory in Christ's name. Amen. I want you to listen. Pastor Dean Dresser is doing something this morning that I, 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 I'm strongly praying about doing. But he, he, he put this, and I've referenced him. Matter of fact, he's a guy that made the statement he'd rather have 15 or 20 sold out posters in a church that are love Jesus, that are obedient and surrendered, than he would have thousands who were self, uh, owning their own self image for us. Listen to what he said. Today he's recognizing the persecution. Do you realize there's 100,000 people killed in 2012? Martyrs for their faith. 2012. More people in the whole century that we're living in than all the world. Ever. Before. This narrative comes from a Christian. And it ought to humble us. How much does it cost us to be here this morning? How much does it cost you to give your life to Christ? Listen to what it says. Azam was a Syrian Muslim who became a Christ follower. When he told his mother, she cried and told him to pack his bags and leave. His father was outraged. Hazan left to begin a new life among the people of the cross. A few weeks later, he received a small, suspicious package. He thought it was too light to be a bomb. He recoiled when he opened it to find the gooey mass of his mother's heart. His dad hired terrorists to execute his mother because she allowed Hazan to become a Christ follower. Months later, Azam heard from one of the executioners who had become a Christ follower. The former terrorist was full of repentance, remorse, and humility. He told Azam that his mother's last words were, Jesus, Jesus, I love you. After reading this, Pastor said he went to a quiet place to pray. I want to ask you this morning, what does it cost you? Is your life any different? Playing a bunch of games? What's the difference? Or the cause of Christ? What is the difference this morning between the church and the non church? Well, what is the difference of the church member? Well, argue over the carpet, but never leave one person. To Christ. What's the difference? We talk about submission to authority. We talk about responding, uh, responding correctly. We talk about being humble this morning in the presence of God. What is the difference in me now and me after before Christ? What's the difference? If you're never been born again this morning, I'm telling you, you're in the act of before Christ. We're going to identify all of that. But I want to ask you this morning, are you living a lie? Do we make excuses not to serve God? Do we make excuses not to, to get out and do what God wants us to do? We talk about baptism. Listen, I want to tell you, there's nothing magical about that water in there. It's just like you back water at home. The difference is, is what Jesus did in your life and you come up there and you display before everybody else the inward action of Christ on an outward expression through baptism. I want to be different. I want to identify with Christ. I want to walk with Christ. I want to be a new man. I want to be a new husband. I want to be a new father. I want to be a new young person. I want to be a little person that's different because I love Jesus. 
That's what it's talking about. And I'm telling you, there's people in this building this morning, you rely on a baptism, you rely on a name on a church membership, grandma, grandpa, somebody else, you never had a relationship with Christ. And your fruit of your life right now knows it. That's the difference. And I'm telling you, when you think about baptism this morning, it doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Salvation took, it, took place when you honored Christ and you surrendered. Listen, you fully surrendered. You changed ownership. You wrote out the script and you said, Lord Jesus, you take my life. I want you to have all of me. And Lord Jesus, I want to take all of you. And I want it to come here. And I want to live in the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you, if your life's any different from that this morning, you need to examine where you are. Has there been a point of salvation and you chose to walk away and you're way down the road down there like I told Bob said this morning, talking about the covenants and the power of God, you couldn't hear God if you had a megaphone. You got outside the will of God. You got outside the unctions of God. I want to tell you the Father standing on the hillside, waving his hand, inviting you to come home, to come back, cry out for forgiveness. Young people, listen to me. Boys and girls, listen to me. Don't miss it this morning. As a fall of God, the touch of God, the power of God, the presence of God displays itself. I want to ask you this morning, that outward expression, is it really different in your life? Are you bored when you're in worship? People say, well, church is boring. Well, I'm telling you, I hope you don't ever come here and get a bored time. Matter of fact, I'm ready to go away private because the music was too loud. Or the music wasn't what you heard. Or the preacher didn't preach out of the right book. Or the preacher didn't do this. I'm ready to be upset about something and to go away and sound bored. I'm ready to go away different because of the touch of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you entered into it and you found out there was something just a little bit different. I'm telling you the time of invitation this morning, you're going to have a time to come. You got your family, you're going to be able to bring your family. You're going to be able to come, you're going to be able to take the Lord's Supper. What does that Lord's Supper say to us this morning? It's a reminder of the regeneration to which we'll talk about. It's a reminder of the regeneration, the washing of the Lord Jesus Christ, the removal of our sins, the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross for us. That's what that is. Oswald Chambers says it like this. He says the difference is our self-interest is put to sleep and the real interest is awakened. I'm telling you, we got some self-interest this morning that are overpowering the power of God. And the self-interest, your self-image needs to be put to sleep and rise up almighty power of God in my life so I might look like and live like God himself. That's the goal. That's the best last thing I'm going to show you is not. Every one of us, if you're born again this morning, you're called to be a saint of God. Every one of us. Go to Matthew, take a look at it. Go to Luke, take a look at it. You're called to be a saint. I'm going to talk to you about that just a little bit. Time to do. The first thing I want to tell you this morning, I'm going to keep it real simple. We got a little bit this morning. So I'm just going to give you three little basic points. But I'm going to tell you it's the gospel. And I'm telling you, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God will move in your life, our lives. I pray that the actions, as people move around, babies cry, people talking, that the Holy Spirit will get your attention this morning. And you'll be able to stay in tune with Him. Because, see, the first thing I want to talk to you about is exactly what Paul was talking to Titus about. The delivery of the message to the church at Crete this morning is the fact of just two words, before Christ. Before Christ. I want you to look at what he says there. Before Christ. I'm telling you, listen, can I just tell you, before Christ, every one of us were messed up? Oh, not me. Oh. Baloney. Greek. You were messed up before Jesus. You, you were fat, you were flat and messed up. Look what Paul says there. Paul says, look, you were foolish. You were, you were foolish. You were disobedient. You know what the word foolish means? Empty. Vain. You walk in that building this morning, you empty vain. Anybody contemplate suicide this morning? Anybody contemplate calling it quits on your marriage? Some of you kids calling it quits and walking out on your family. Some dad or some husband or some mom walked out on your family for whatever reason. I'm talking to you guys, but you guys are on a journey trying to get healthy. You stay the journey. And you complete the course. God's got you where you are. Where's my brother at this morning? His daughter's got MS and his wife fell in the best race. Uh, where's he at? Tell me your name. 
Scotty. And I'll tell you what's hard. Scotty, stay up. Scotty's wife is Kalina. His daughter is Chelsea. Chelsea was diagnosed with MS. Kalina uh, fell at Nissan and messed her leg. If you tell me it ain't hard for this man to stay where he's at, knowing his family wants him, needs him. We got some men on a journey today. Nobody knows. But they're on an important journey. Amen. Somebody needs them. Yeah. Come around here, buddy, Scott. I want you to bow. I want you to pray with me. Kalina's his wife. Chelsea's his daughter. God, I pray right now for Scott. God, I pray you'd hold him. Pray God you'd hold him on the path. God, I pray, God, for his, for his daughter this morning, Chelsea. God, I just live to tell you, God, diagnosis of MS. God, I pray she would bow down and she would strive forward and this dad would just pray over his daughter. Pray for his wife, Kalina. I pray, God, for her healing and her touch. And God, I pray for the peace of God in this man's life. And God, he would hold and stay firm. God, I pray for our men who are ministered five hours away today for the function of God. God bless. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. But I'm telling you, before Christ, he said, we're foolish, we're empty, we're vain, everything inside of us. Listen to what he says. And don't miss this. Disobedient. You know what that word means this morning? Chaotic. You like chaotic? Define it down to disobedience. What word is that? Rage. That word there literally means light and rage. Anybody been in a fit of rage before Jesus? Some of us, if you're, if you're, if you're truthful, you've been in a fit of rage after Jesus. Our homes are like hell if you're wondering what's going on. That's what he's talking about. Look what he says there. Then he talks about deception. What is deception? Life without Jesus is going to be all right. Life without Jesus, you're going to get to heaven. Oh, just go over and take that little indulgence right there. Just dive right on in. It's going to be happy. It's going to be fun. They don't tell you about the detriment in the valley. They don't tell you about laying out the gutter of life. They don't tell you about when you go in the cell and you got to peek through the hole and somebody tells you when you can get dressed. Somebody tells you when you need. Somebody lays you. They don't tell you all that stuff. They don't tell you what happens when your wife walks out the door and slams and says, I don't want you anymore. They don't tell you none of that. It's the voice of deception. That's what he's talking about. Life before Jesus. Uh, just uh, let, let, let me just tell you, life without Jesus is not what it's made out to be. By the world standards. You understand? I'm telling you, uh, you know, if you're searching this morning and you, empty, you come to the right place, you came in without hope, you come to the right place. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ wants to fill you. He wants to touch you. He wants to move on your life like you never moved. I told you that word malice. Anybody want to take a shot at what malice means? When's the last one time you said somebody said, you're just full of malice? If I didn't know what to say. But if you look at all the translations, it's there. And that word malice simply means badness. You're full of badness. You're full of evil. You're full of depravity. What it means is, is a life of, is malign. I like to think of it as malignancy. It's a full of malignancy of the world. And that's what happens. You see that, that awful life is being described before Christ. And then look what it says there. Trouble. Uh, that, that the word malice has to do with trouble and, uh, and naughtiness and wickedness. And then look here, it talks about these passions. Envy and hateful, detesting one another, literally hating one another. Well, the truth is, there's a wife and husband here, you literally hate each other. You're just surviving. Why not just let Jesus take control? Captive of passions. Captives of pleasures. Some of us here, we got hatred toward our parents or toward those that, are, that have been in our life. That's what he's talking about before Christ. We need to deal with that. I'm going to show you why. Not knowing what God really is. That, that fact of just pervertedness. Pleasure seeking. I'm telling you, the, the enemy has sold us a, a good bill of goods on pleasure. Steals our life. We're doing it in the name of family. We're doing it in the name of fun. But we took God out. Before Jesus. You see how simple that is? Even these little ones, they'll begin to get it. Because I tell you, life without Jesus is messed up. 
But you know, there's a great word. It's that little word, three letter word that I told you to highlight, underline, put stars around, all that kind of stuff. You see, you got the life before Jesus, and in verse 4, but, but, Jesus. But, woo! See that word, but? You ever had somebody say, well, uh, I love you, but? Guess what happened? What happened to the but? Just took everything else away. Everything before got erased. All that good stuff they just told you about you being pretty and, and all, you know, I'm going to live the life rest of my life with you and I'm going to love you and, and we're going to do this, we're going to do that, but out the window. It's kind of like people, they know me well enough, our people's beginning to know, if you tell me I'm going to try or I might, what does that mean, guys? No. Big no one. You. you show up, I'm blessed. But I ain't going to count Anytime you say you might have tried, what you really mean is don't find a way out. I might. When, when did, go ahead and look at the scripture. When did Jesus tell you he might? Go, go find it in there. Jesus said, I'm going to try. That's an English messed up translation that you and I like to use. I might get there. I've taught our staff. Somebody tell you they might be here on the platform? No. Not gonna happen. I might, I might get to work day. No, not happen. You show up, I'm blessed. You don't, I knew it was gonna happen anyway. You learn to do that. You don't find that in the Word of God. But, but, here's the deal. Before Jesus, we were messed up. But I want you to tell you what we once were because of Jesus. Maybe you walked in here this morning and you in the before Jesus status of life. But Jesus changes you. What you once were were is there no more. You are, you are totally changed. Look, look what he says. But when the goodness and love for man. And don't let nobody tell you God don't love you. Don't let nobody tell you that you're not worth something. Jesus Christ died for you. Get valuable. God gave his only son so that you might have eternal life. The goodness and love for man appeared. Listen, not from anybody else. Look, I'll read in your comment, God. Word. Don't look at me. Somebody be mad at me anyway. Y'all slow up. Look at the word of God. Appeared from God. Is that on the screen? Put it on the screen, baby. Appeared from God, not from you. Do you need to get that? The good, see, there's nothing good about me and you. We stink. We flesh. We're wicked. We're evil. But Jesus. But Jesus. Appeared from God, he saved us. Not by works of righteousness. Righteousness. Listen, that we had done. How many of you trying to work your way to heaven? Somebody's told you, hey, paradise is up there. You're going to get to be a king someday. There it goes. Not by works of righteousness that we had done. Can I just tell you, I'm going to pop your bubble this morning. You can't do it. Amen. I don't care. I don't care how fit you are, guys. I don't care how beautiful you are, ladies. How charming you guys are. Not going to happen. You can't do it. Keep it up there. I'll take it off. So look what happens. But. See, there's that word, but. What happened? I just told you a little bit ago. All this stuff's gone. What's gone? The righteousness of the works we had. What takes place? So maybe looking on the back. That's good. You can see it. But according. According to what? His. His what? Mercy. Man, I'm telling you, where would we be without the mercy and the grace of God? Mercy. Not giving us what you and I deserve. Grace giving us way more than we ever thought we deserve. Some of us got big heads. We think somebody owes us something. You and I are not owed anything. Let me just pop your other ball. Nobody owes you nothing. That's probably not good English, but it is. Nobody owes me nothing. Now, if you remember now, what I preach is already preached to me, and I'm preaching to me right now. Nobody owes me nothing. What we once were can change because of the goodness of God. Love appeared how? In Jesus Christ. Through his mercy. 
God's affection toward this dirty, right, heathen like me. How did he prove it? Boys and girls, how did God prove his love for, for you? Through Jesus Christ. That's how he proved it. Young people, how did he prove his love for you? Sarah, how did he prove his love for you? Jesus Christ. First of all, how did he prove his love for you? Look at that. How did he prove his love for you? Jesus Christ. Church, how did he prove his love for you? Jesus Christ. That's exactly what he did. That's how he did it. And I'm telling you, it's nothing you've done. Say nothing I've done. Nothing I've done. All about God. All about God. And I want to ask you this morning, have you accepted the free gift of salvation? Really? Yes. Has it really made a difference in your life? Your human effort will never obtain salvation. Look at that word up there. According to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration. Go to that next part. Washing of regeneration. That, that, that forgiveness of sin right there. You see it? The renewal of the Holy Spirit of God. There's two important words there. Regeneration and renewal. That only takes place in Jesus Christ. The washing away of our sin. Listen, I wish I had the time this morning. You go back and look at the Old Testament in the tabernacle. You had the ladder. And you had to go and you had the priest had to wash before they went inside. So it is with you and I. I'm trying to explain this to our folks this morning. So many times we think, well, we can just go out and do what we want to. I'm going in what we call church on Sunday morning. And I'm going to worship God. Not before you go to the ladder for cleansing. What is the ladder? Going before the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a high priest. He shed his blood for our sin. He went to Calvary's cross. It's the shed blood of Jesus that, that, that uh, forgives and regenerates our sin. So you and I go before the throne of God. We cry out. Listen, you can go before the throne of God on your own as a believer through the blood of Jesus. He is the high priest. So when you go before the blood of Jesus at the throne of God, then we cry out for forgiveness of sin. And God in his what? Mercy and his grace forgives you and me of everything we've ever done. Amen. When he forgives us, then you can go into the presence of God and worship. And you can't do it any other way. There is no other way. You try to do it any other way, you did it in false clothing. You did it in something that wasn't honoring God. It's a big deal. And, and, and so another term for that, on that forgiveness of sin, is called new birth. You got two birthdays. You got your physical birth, and then you got your spiritual birth. You may not know exactly, maybe like me, I can't tell you exactly the day of my spiritual birth. But I know at 16 years old, God saved me. I got two births. I got my physical birth, and then I got my new birth. And that's my new birth, and my new birth is found in the newness of Christ. And I'm telling you, listen, we do not need to come to the reality that God has made ample preparation for this new birth. Think about that old boy that I read about that, that took and executed that old boy's mom and then cut her heart out, put it in an envelope and delivered it to him. See, somehow or you and I as these American Christians need to realize this Christian stuff is real. Amen. It's real. It's not play games with it. It's to lay down our life for what Jesus Christ did. Lay down our life. Because of Jesus Christ. Why did all that happen? I want you to look at it. There in verse 7. He had a purpose. You see what he did? And then she's keeping on the screen. Renewal of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit, look what happened. Listen, the Holy Spirit poured out on us abundantly. Listen, there's people out there that talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You've got, to be, you've got to be baptized to be saved. You've got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, all this kind of stuff. Listen, the Word of God tells you that Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is your reason for salvation. Amen. Then what happens? You and I get a bonus. What's the bonus? The Holy Spirit of God. When you go back and you read, just go do your own study. Don't believe this preacher. Don't go believe some other preacher. Go look in your own, get in God's Word, figure out what God's Word is telling you, and look at the facts. Go look at the context and look at the facts. When you look at the, 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 the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, he came to this earth as a baby. Did he come as a man? He did. He came as the son of man. He came as the son of God. He came in a baby. 
but then he grew to be a man, all right? I'm just saying, my bad. He came in as the son of man, and he came as the son of God. He walked on this earth. There came a time when he was 30 years old. Who baptized him? John the Baptist. Did he need to be baptized? No. Why was he baptized? To set an example for you and I. When he went out, he did a symbolism. Dying to the old self. Dying to sin. Raising the new life. All right? What happened to him? When he come up out of the water, what descended on him? A dove. Representation of what? The Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God at that point was given to man. God, uh, 40 days later, the Lord Jesus descended, it, uh, ascended into heaven. And what did he say? I'm going to tell the disciples that he told you and I was the New Testament church. I'm going away, but I'm going to send to you one who will be your comforter, who will be your power, who will you be your God, who will be your paraclete, the one that comes on the sides. It's the Holy Spirit of God. I'm about to have a fill up here. I'm telling you, it's God and something else. And you think about it, I'm about to fill up here. But the thing is, the standard of acceptance, when you think about it, don't let somebody tell you it's Jesus plus somebody else. Amen. Come on, guys, get real. What's the word of God and read it for what it is? Amen. Read it for the Son of God and what he says. It's Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, if some of you ever get a hold of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God, you will dance. Right. You won't be glued to your pews or super glue, I promise you. It'll be the power of God unto salvation. It's the difference in the church member and the Christian. It's the difference in what God really wants to be in our life. It's the grace of God. It's the unmerited favor. And I meant to tell you about justified. We just kind of cleared right over it. But the deal is, when you think about justified, it's a rich. Anytime you see that, mark this down, guys. Anytime you see it as a reference to man, it's in the passive tense. Anybody want to tell me why it's in the passive tense? Because it happens. Anybody want to take a guess? The reason it's in the passive tense is, back up, Jen. You're justified by the grace. Back up one more time. Because the works of righteousness that we had done, it's not by the works of righteousness, but according to his mercy through the washing and regeneration. Go ahead. And we know about the Holy Spirit. Go ahead. This Spirit, the Holy Spirit, poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that having been justified by his grace. Why is that word in the passive tense? Because it has nothing to do with being you. It's only by the active power of God. It's passive when it's referenced to you and I. It's active when it's referenced to God. Because all the work is on God and not only in you. That'd be a good place for amen. Tell me, that's the deal. Let's talk about party. Uh, a harmony with Jesus Christ, that standard of acceptance. So we're talking about before Jesus. We're talking about but Jesus. Now look what he says. We're going to wrap it up. And I'm telling you, I want God to get all the glory. Two little words to wrap it up. But Jesus, before Jesus, but Jesus, after Jesus. Amen. After Jesus. Now guys, I want to tell you, that ought to be a difference. There ought to be a difference in your life. If you're telling me there's a but Jesus moment, then there ought to be a difference in every one of these little boys and girls, mamas and daddies and adults and grandparents, church members. I'm telling you, the activity of God, you folks that are visible this morning, I want to just tell you, just proud for forgiveness this morning and ask God to glorify you and touch your life. Can't stand this morning, it's going to be tough in heaven. Amen. After Jesus, listen to what it says. What that really means is to live justly. Did you see that? When he's talking about the, the fact that verse 6 is verse 7, that Jesus Christ our Savior, he justified us by his grace. Look what he says now in the latter part of verse 7, that we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. And then he says, this is a trustworthy saying. Uh, say, I want you to insist, to declare, to push these things. So listen, to, don't miss this. So that those who have believed God might be careful to devote themselves to good works. Then he says this is good and profitable. Well, this is not for a few, but for everyone. When he's talking about living justly, living righteously, talking about being full of God's work, God's works. He's talking about being literally, listen to me, saints of God. And if you're one of those folks this morning, say, I'm not no saint. I'm going to tell you all people. If you're a child of let me take a step, brother. If you tell me you're not a saint, saint this morning, Oswald Chambers had this this week. Some of you read. 
He said, if you declare that you're not a state saint, one of two things. By your choice. See, here's the deal. We want our little piece of paper. So we can say, I'm saved, and we go out doing what we want to do. That's really what we want. The old world, old world used to call it a fire insurance policy. But I'm telling you, the church is still after that one day. We, we, want a, we want a little piece of paper so I can say, I got this stuff, Jesus, be dangerous. So it's either by your choice, either you not, do not want to be like a saint, or listen, here's the deal. Or you don't believe God's big enough to make you a saint. That's the only two ways. You can tell me, oh, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. I know that Bible preacher. If you know Jesus, life's going to be different. And the Word of God. You might say, well, where's all this saint stuff come in? Go to 1 Corinthians. Just write that. 1 Corinthians 1 2. Go to the first part of Romans. Go back and do a search of the word saints. You're set apart in the holiness of God. The high priest is the Lord Jesus Christ. He sanctifies you and me through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That gives us all heaven that's open to us. All of heaven. It's there for the choosing. Here's the deal. I might be saved. I'm going to try to be saved. No, you're never going to be saved. Amen. Surrender. Jesus, I want all you got. You get all of me, Jesus. This mess, this God of mess, Jesus, you get it. But I want all you got. That's all he wants to tell you. That's the difference this morning. I'm telling you, there's a, there's a before Jesus moment. We act like heathens and deception. And I want to tell you, the reason I told you that all in front of you, because if your life is still, look, got back to that list, that you slander. That you like to cause trouble. That you like to find everything wrong that you can find wrong. That you want to fight at the drop of a hat. That you want to disagree and be very disagreeable. If you don't like being kind, if you don't want to show gratitude, if you don't want to be gentle, if you don't want to, 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 to reach out and touch and help other people, if you don't want to love, well, I love, but, but I got love on my tongue. You better go to confession before the Father. Because something's wrong. Can't love on your terms as a born again believer. You've got to learn love on God's terms. And I'm telling you, it's not easy. I had a conversation with a guy this week, and I love this guy with all my heart, and we were just talking about where he was in life. And, and I'm telling you, it's a process of God working in your life, and God begins to build that love, and God tells you how to love, and He begins to show you how to love. And that first step there is to humble yourself and to pray before Him and watch what God does. Amen. God will make you into the same He wants you to be. So, what's the difference? I want you to remove all conditions in your life this morning. I want you to remove all conditions in your life. I want you to think about an unconditional life. I want you to think about an unconditional life. Not an if, then kind of approach. I just want you to say, God, you're mine. God, I want you to take the conditions you live. God, I want to lift myself to you. I want to ask you, don't play games. I want to ask you not to look around, God. I want to ask you to be real. David, really, when you're here for Wednesday night, you'll come forward. Gene Hyman, you were here Wednesday night. Hardy Baldwin, you were here Wednesday night. But you were here Wednesday night. So I'm happy to give you a pass you that. Who else? What's one of my other guys up here? Come here, Bill. Preston, you were here Wednesday night. Come here. I want you to raise your hand if you wasn't here Wednesday night. I want these guys to give you one of these. Who else is here Wednesday night that might be I want I want everybody in the house. This is not, not nothing you might stand up and give a raise. We're great. You're here Wednesday night. We're great. We're great. Raise your hand here. What's one of my other guys? Just when you look at me. Everybody in the house. Yes, everybody. I want you to get one. It's not a threat. You ain't about to stand up, give the testimony, give the test. Pastor ain't going to hold it. Why do you give it? I want you to listen to me. I want you to hold it. The Holy Spirit of God's got a reason. 
Guys, you pass them out. I want everybody to get one. Don't leave it on the pew. That's all I ask you. What you do with it when you leave here between you and God. But don't leave it on the pew. Here's the deal. What's the difference? When you get this paper, there's going to be ten things on there that I'm asking you to do over the next six and a half months. Six and a half months. It's based on John 3.30. I gave a bunch more scriptures. If you want more of them, I'll give them to you. But I want you to do it on your own. It's got space. Don't fold it up. Hang on a second. It's got a space there for you to write scriptures and to write your own notes. Would you be willing for the next six months to have a regular time of devotion, Bible reading, and prayer before God? Would you be willing to pray for your pastor? If you remember another church, pray for them. If you're not, you come here, pray for us. It's pastor, staff, God's divine movement. Listen, I want to just tell you, I'm praying that God's going to build this building where we've got to put chairs. People will be on the outside. May not be another person praying for me, but I think I got four or five anyway. That God will put us out of here and force us into the kingdom. Number three, lead someone. Would you be willing the next six months to lead at least one person to Christ? Would you be willing to lead and encourage someone to get involved in the body of Christ? That means get involved in a local body. Wherever you belong, if you don't belong anywhere, here. Would you be willing to lead out and share your testimony regularly as a God, as a proof that God's working you in your life? Guys, when you get through, bring the extra there on front floor. Would you be willing to lead out and share that testimony to what God's doing in your life? Would you be willing to get outside your comfort zone? If you were in Noah Paul said this morning, that came up. It should have. Will you will be willing to get outside your comfort zone if God leads and, allows to make, uh, and allow you to make a difference in the kingdom? Would you be willing to come up with God and be obedient in church attendance and give your tithe, time, and talent for His glory? That's significant. Tithe, church attendance, talent, and time. Would you be willing to reevaluate your life and lifestyle on a regular basis after the Bible study this morning? Would you be willing to become involved in men's, women's, youth, or children's Bible study on a regular basis? That's outside of Bible study on Sunday morning, but at least one of them. I'll take Sunday morning. That's the best we can get. And the last one, you may be willing to make an effort to befriend someone that you do not know very well. To hang out, to have dinner, to do some kind of activity with them. That's being in the church, all right? All I ask you to do is you don't uh, leave it on the pew. That's between you and God. I'm here in this moment. I gave it to you. I've been obedient as a pastor. I want our people to get real. I'm telling you, I'm praying that God's going to take us in places He's never taken us. And I'm telling you this morning, we're about to have this invitation time, and I'm about to give you how it's going to happen. And I challenge you this morning not to play games. Matter of fact, you look at your little paper, it says John 3 30, he must increase, I must decrease. And down at the bottom, it says, and see what God will do. All I'm asking you to do is to give God a chance. I'm asking you to step out and give and be honorable to God and watch what God will do. Quit saying I'll pray about it and just say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. God, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll be what you want me to do. I'll give where you want me to give. God, I surrender. And for some of us this morning, it begins this morning with the surrender of your life. You need to give God your life and surrender and accept his forgiveness for your sin and be saved from a sinner's hell and gain a glorious heaven. That you'll exchange your life in surrender for him. For some of us this morning, we've been living at a way far distance from God. And I'm telling you, for some of you this morning, that you come to the point where you say, God, I want you to be uh, God of my life. I want you to be Lord of my life again, God. I want to get back up close and personal to you. For some of us this morning, you need to join a family of faith somewhere. May not be here, but somewhere. You need to get involved. Pastor, I don't need to go to church and be saved. True statement. But if you're saved, you don't want to be in church. You're going to be a like-minded people. It's amazing to me we'll go to Walmart when we can go other places, but we go to Walmart because we want to go to Walmart. We'll say, well, I don't have to go to church. I you going to get you stuck if you don't go somewhere? Well, I realize, well, let me just tell you this. You don't even have to go to a physical place. I realize you've got to be naked. You're going to Walmart.com and deliver your door, but you still got to do it. And see what God will do in your life. I'm telling you, and I want to give you one last thing. I'm going to leave you in this invitation. Matthew 12, 30, Luke 11, 23, both of them say, Jesus says that you're either for me or against me. I'm going to tell you right now, we're about to go into invitation time. It's not a time to get up and go to the restaurant. It's not a time to slip out. You know, waiting too late. Any movement ought to be to the office of God. In just a moment, I'll give you an opportunity. The office of God are to these tables with this bread and bread.
If your family's here this morning, I'd love for you to come as a family. You might want to pray. It's also maybe forward and have to give it a little bit of time. I understand that. Maybe it's family members of Mercy House. You know your, your husband or your son is here. Yeah, family, maybe you want to join up somehow and come on fine with that. This is open everybody's everybody for you. If you need me to serve you for some reason, if you'll come to me, I'll serve you. I know some folks have a lease that way. That's fine with me. But I want to just tell you, I'm going to give you a moment. Before you come to this table, before you come to this altar this morning, you may have went all the way through worship and you might have been saying, God, I'm not right, or God, I'm not this, or God, I'm not that, or, or God this, or God that. Well, I'm going to give you a moment and I want you to be clean. I want you to be clean. I want you to say, Lord, I want you to forgive me. God, I want you to cleanse me. God, I want you to make me whole. God, I want, I want to come. I want to take. And here's what I want you to do. Just a moment, we'll leave you in the prayer chair. Are you pray saying we'll get here? Uh, I, the, the fact is, is uh, before you come, I want to take, you to take the time. And all you do is come and take your bread and take your juice. You're completed it. You can take your little cup with your leave it on the table. Get it back to your seat. Okay. Be very obedient. What I'm asking you to do is we come down the center aisles and then we go back up and go out to the, the, the side aisles and back to our seats. Okay. So down the center and you got three places. I don't care where you come. If we run out at one station, there's two of them. And there's enough for everybody. I promise. But we're coming down the middle center aisles and we're coming here and we're going out. So just try to focus that way. You'll just flow better that way. It'll, it'll make it a bit easier. So that's what I want you to do this morning. I want to lead us in a word of prayer to you, whoever's coming, if you're coming to the end. And uh, if you'd like to take this time to pray and take your words up with your head, I'm going to ask you to bow your head right now. It's a very serious time. I don't want kids coming by themselves. I want them to come with adults. It's a very serious time. Paul says that when he writes and gives the account of Lord's Supper, that Jesus took and he blessed the bread and passed it. And he said, You take it, you remember this is my body. That was shed for you. After he passed the bread, he took the cup and blessed it. He said, take and drink, because this is in remembrance of the blood that was shed for you. This morning, I want you to think about that blood. I want you to think about his body on the cross. I want you to think about forgiveness of sin. See, it's a personal time, just like this sheep, just like your relationship. I'll ask you, what's the difference? Maybe you got somebody in a wheelchair that can't come forward. You come and get their juice, you come get their bread, take it out, you understand that. You can't walk forward unless somebody come get it and bring it back to you. I have no problem with that. Um, if you got uh, Casey, if you're coming to get you a dinner for or somebody needs to, to get you, we'll, we'll do that. And uh, But uh, we want you to come on your own as God would lead. I'll be down front. Uh, if you want somebody to pray with you, we'd be glad to do that. These offers can fill up. I'm perfectly fine with that. Just be careful. That's why I want you to have your kids uh, with you this morning. I think it can be a beautiful time. We'll close. It's not going to take long for everybody to come through. And uh, this is your time right now. Before the world. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, as every little boy and every little girl that understands, as every young man and young lady understands, as every man and woman, every, every husband and every wife, and every grandfather, every grandmother, every guest in this building understands this morning, it's open communion. It's about a relationship with God. It's about a difference maker, that being Jesus Christ has made a difference in our life. It's not a if, it's not a might, it's not I'll try. It's about Jesus. It's about surrendering our life to Him. It's about the fact that we've acknowledged Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We follow who believers baptism the word that we are living for you. That's what it's about this morning. So God, I want you to have all the glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the cross. Thank you for the shed blood. That's our salvation. That's the difference maker. After Jesus, but Jesus, and now we're living uh, from the standpoint of just serving you, God. Thank you that we're not in the before Jesus' life, that we can live in victory. It's ours. Have your way, Christ. You come. Just stand up and come. Come to the middle and come back.
you know, some of us feel like the work was, was terrible. I thought about y'all with your little Austin Down syndrome, little grandson that's bright. I got to see Austin last Sunday. Cancer, stage four cancer. Miss Barbara, Jamie, her daughter, her granddaughter who's been here, diagnosed with cancer. One of her other daughters who's 21 with just a little small baby. Don't really know what happened. She's been in a coma. I thought about that. I thought about my nephew who has that disease where he's lost all of his hair, or he's losing all of his hair. I thought about the guy there that's struggling with the addiction. All of us have scars, and we have stain on our life. But Jesus Christ, but Jesus. Takes it all away. Takes it all away. And I want you to leave with that thought this morning because that's what it's all about. I want you to be praying for Miss Barbara and her family and uh, Jamie and the Jamieson Rid program. Asia, her other granddaughter, is over in Providence. I don't think to try to see this week. There's so much more on the rounds. Mother comes in. Buster came this morning, he's a pastor. Been with him, I prayed with him, we watched his family, I love his family, his wife, his kids. Could be more precious than the God family. We got them up here, God destroyed their house and the friend ended up up here. Anyway, he came this morning, he said, Brother Davis, I've never been saved, but he said, I'm going to be baptized and I'll be right. He came this morning. Just on a request, said, Can I speak to the church? And he said, Yeah, come with that fresh leg. So I want you to come by. I want you to encourage him this morning. Jenny, I want you to come and stand with him. Uh, Jake, you're in here. If you want to come stand by your big old daddy. And, uh, I want you just to come and encourage him. Bring back. And, uh, and just come and stand with him. That's another reason we just got him the kids to go out this morning. But I want you to come by and encourage this guy. They must have, I didn't ask you for permission, but I want you to come here. This old boy right here, he's about like one of mine. He is one of mine, really. His daddy is my son, my son Chris, second daddy. 